Hello, welcome to From the South. I'm Laura Prada from the Telesur headquarters in Caracas, Venezuela. We begin with the news. Stay with us. Venezuelan President Nicolás Maduro has proposed that early elections are held for the opposition-led National Assembly. President Maduro made the announcement this Monday, May 20th, that marks one year since he was re-elected with nearly 68% of the votes, beating two opposition candidates. Since the election, the president survived an assassination attempt and the latest coup attempt, which took place on, May, on April 30th. Chavistas are also celebrating the country's triumph over the sabotage of the electrical system and resilience of the people amid the financial blockade and theft of Venezuela's assets. Today, I'm making a proposal to the opposition. We're going to hold elections. We're going to legitimize the only institution that hasn't been legitimate for the past five years. We're going to have early elections for the National Assembly. We'll see whose side the people are on, who has the vote. We accept the challenge. We're going to have a peaceful, democratic and constitutional solution. You have to respect the sovereign will of the people. Why won't they respond to this proposal? During his message to the nation, the Venezuelan president thanked the people for their strength in defending the country's serenity and spoke about the positive results from the tax with the opposition being held in Norway. We've had a first day of talks mediated by the Norwegian government in the north of Europe, in the Nordic region. I have to say that it's been very positive. I'm a man who believes that words are the way to communicate differences. I'm a man of peace because what I know is peace and the struggle for it. Don't mistake me for a fool. Don't think I'm naive. I believe in peace. I believe in dialogue. But I'm preparing the people to defend the homeland, however it may be, wherever it may be, and whenever it may be. We're prepared to defend the homeland. And now we talk about Colombia. The special jurisdiction for peace in Colombia, says former FARC leader Jesus Santrich, has not been extradited to the United States due to the lack of evidence. In an official statement, the court says it does not have enough information to establish when Santrich would have committed the alleged drug trafficking crime he's accused of by the United States. The authorities have appealed that, that decision. Meanwhile, the FARC political party has rejected the, judici the judicial plot against Jesus Santrich. In an official statement, the party also rejected the role of the state in the killing of peace supporters and says it will take urgent actions to guarantee that peace agreements are fulfilled. On Saturday, the New York Times published an article on how the head of the Colombian army ordered his troops to double down on, ki on killings, even at the risk of higher civilian casualties. Colombian Senator Ivan, du Ivan Cepeda spoke to Telesur and said this is a continuation of the deadly security policies implemented by former President Álvaro Uribe. We have is an attempt to resurface all criminal practices against human rights. The main object here is to design policies and legal instruments to allow members of military forces to murder people in order to fulfill a series of requirements and reach a specific number of murders and prepare a report for their higher officials. We need to completely eradicate these criminal acts from the history of the military forces of Colombia. If it is a part of the doctrine that any measure is vital to obtain results, it is obvious that they are going to present for results by murdering social leaders and civilians. These policies are not only within the framework of armed operations against criminal organizations, but also promotes other forms of violence, such as the murdering of social leaders. After the article was published, the Minister of Defense, Guillermo Botero, tried to defend the actions of the army. After the inaccuracies published in an article during the weekend, I will say that the main point to clarify to the public opinion is that according to a decree of the Colombian Constitution of 2011, the defense of the people's rights is to face the aggressors. This is the purpose of the Colombian military forces. 
The aggressor needs to be under control. People that vulnerate the law must face justice, and we do it based on our Constitution and the Supreme Court of Justice. I repeat what I said many times on August 7, 2018. President Ivan Duque asked me to observe the law, the Constitution, and the human rights, and I have repeated this many times to commanders, and they have also reiterated it to their members. Also responding to the oracle, a lawyer's association denounced the selective assassination policies of the armed forces. The Jose Alvear Restrepo organization said that the same situation led to the murder of thousands of young people in the so-called false positive scandal from 2002 until 2010. They said the order given by the army authorities placed innocent civilians at risk. And a Colombian feminist activist, Jar Mayerlis Angarita, was attacked while inside a car in Barranquilla. She had previously denounced death threats against her from her work with the victims of the armed conflict. Mayerlis Angarita works with a group of hundreds of women after the peace agreements was signed. She was traveling with her children and a nephew on Saturday when an armed man approached the car and shot her at a shot at her. Police said they were investigating the incident. Yet another under garage migrant has died while in the custody of the U.S. Customs and Border Protection Agency. In an official statement shared on social media, the agency says a 16-year-old Guatemalan boy passed away early on Monday at the West Laque station in the Rio Grande Valley. The cause of death is still unknown and the boy had reportedly been apprehended on May 13th near Hidalgo, Texas for illegal entry into the country. Like this, you go to a first break here from the South. Make sure you follow us on Twitter at Telesur English and on my account at Laura Pitilesur. Stay with us. And we are back. The 24th March of Silence has taken place across Europe against a civic military dictatorship. 43 years after the legislators Selmar Michelini and Hector Gutierrez Ruiz, as well as activists Rosario Barredo and William Whitelaw, were found dead in Buenos Aires, demonstrators are condemning impunity before the law. The communist leader Benjamin Liberov disappeared on the same day in 1976. stand against legal impunity today she stated prominent dictatorship figure Jose Nino Gavazo admitted at the military tribunal that he threw the body of Tupamaro National Liberation Movement member Roberto Gomez Son Soro into the Rio Negro The Mexican President Andres Manuel López Obrador seeks to turn the commitment of the United States of investing in Central America into reality and striking a concrete deal with the Trump administration. President López Obrador said he wants the United States government to ditch the so-called media initiative that deploys millions of dollars for security programs in Mexico instead of development programs. United States President Donald Trump has made commitments for U.S. investment in Central America and Mexico to halt migration, but earlier this year he ordered to end United States aid into the region. We do not want the Merida plan. We do not want helicopter gunships. We don't want that type of cooperation. We want cooperation for development because that is what will help us calm the country, calm Central America, and to have peace with justice and well-being. And human rights organizations in El Salvador are opposing attempts by lawmakers to pass a national reconciliation law that would allow to pardon war crimes committed during the 12-year-long armed conflict in the country. What consequences would this bring? Let's find out more in the following story. Relatives of victims of the armed conflict are demanding truth, justice and reparations from the state in cases of Syrian human rights violations 
during the El Salvador Civil War, which left over 75,000 dead and missing. Blanca Salazar condemns the kidnapping of three of her brothers in 1989. We've been to military bases, to police stations, to prisons, but as time passes, we stop hearing anything about them. No one told us anything, so we left it at that. We looked for my brothers for so long, but we stopped because no one longer had hope. The situation of victims is increasingly complicated because of the intentions of a commission of the Legislative Assembly, which wants to approve a national reconciliation law, considered by many as a new amnesty law for war criminals, something that's already been deemed unconstitutional since 2016. History has already taught us that impunity is not the way towards a national reconciliation. As such, we make an appeal to the Legislative Assembly, to the elites behind it who are pushing for this agreement, not to make the same mistake that was made in 1993. A new amnesty is not right. It is not in accordance with our national legal system or with what is mandated by the Constitutional Court. Therefore, we are going to continue denouncing the proposed silencing of victims' voices. UN transitional justice experts urge lawmakers not to pass a bill which would lead to the immediate pardon of war criminals. I think the victims deserve respect, they deserve dignity, they deserve justice. They deserve to know the whole truth about those who have disappeared and those who were murdered. A few days before the end of President Salvador Sánchez Serén's term in office, victims demand that the president veto the reconciliation law if it is approved, since those who supported participated in serious human rights violations, which would go unpunished. Authorities continue to expel farmers from the Panamanian region of Baru from the ter their territory, which will be given to the International Co Corporation del Monte. The communities reject the decision, saying that hundreds of families depend on the land to survive. Felicito Pitti has been farming these lands for more than 20 years, but now the Panamanian authorities have destroyed his crops and the plantations of another hundred local farmers in order to give the lands to the company Del Monte. We are proud to continue to farming this very productive territory, but they have destroyed the land. There are approximately 20, 25 local farmers who have lost everything. The machine from the company came with the complicity of authorities. The machines keep sweeping the land, which was taken by the farmers after the company Chiquita Brands International abandoned the area in the 1990s, leaving the place in poverty. You can see what is happening here. You can see the machine damaging the crops. There is empty terrain that the company could take and do whatever it wants with, but it's easier to take over lands that are ready clean and farm it that to start where there are plants and shrubs. More than 5,400 hectares were given to the international company, including close to 1,900 largely subsistence farms that are used by around 400 families, which negatively impacts their way of life. Mr. Valera came with a foreign company to destroy the Panamanians who do not take a single cent from the government to take care of their families. What the government is doing is not right. There is barely any evidence of the old banana crop. The farmers return from their land, fearing what the companies may leave behind. There is nothing, only total destruction. This is not right. The community has to get together and denounce the authorities before a court, including the president, because of the continuous prosecutions leveled against them. An indigenous community in Paraguay has started using digital technology to protect their land. The tech project includes several people called monitors that take photographs using a cell phone app to automatically cre create a map to outline the borders of the terrain. The community says this will help them protect lands that in the past have been occupied by large-scale producers. The loss of land and natural resources are the main issues for the communities. Experts say it's one of the main reasons 75% of them live in poverty or extreme poverty.
Time for a second break. Stay tuned. Welcome back. In Sudan, protesters have accused the Sudanese military of procrastinating during transitional talks. These were more demonstrations in Khartoum this Monday amid an ongoing sitting. Protesters are threatening to continue the sitting and spread the protest if talks are not completed soon. The military council does not give us all our demands. At the next negotiation session at 9 p.m., we will continue our sitting everywhere and take our demands away because all that is happening now is procrastination. Meanwhile, the deputy leader of Sudan's military council has assured that all concerns will be heard. He also announced that suspects in connection with shootings that took place this week have been arrested. Unidentified attackers opened fire this Monday at a sit-in by pro-democracy demonstrators, killing one police officer and injuring several people. We want free and fair elections and for the Sudanese people to elect whom they want. The perpetrators who killed protesters have been arrested and will be revealed to the media shortly or after a few hours, but will be presented today. They recorded a judicial confession and were taped doing so. If we are liars, the camera does not lie. And the Palestinian Authority has said the U.S. government did not consult them regarding a U.S.-led conference in Bahrain next month designed to encourage investment in the West Bank and Gaza Strip. The White House announced the conference on Sunday and they say it's part of President Donald Trump's so-called deal of the century. The Palestinian Authority have, however, said any solution does not address Palestinian people's core demands for an end to Israel's occupation will, work, will not work. Cabinet stresses that it wasn't consulted about the reported workshop, neither about the content, nor the outcome, and nor the timing. It clarifies that the financial crisis that the Palestinian National Authority is living through today is a result of the financial war that is being waged against us in order to win political consensus. We do not submit to blackmail and we don't trade our political rights for money. Now, to get more detailed information about this issue, we have the following report that sent us earlier our correspondent, Nayara Tardo. Welcome, Nayara. Palestine's Prime Minister says the Palestinian Authority was not approached regarding the summit organized by the United States, which is set to take place at the end of June in Bahrain, regarding investments in the West Bank and the Gaza border. The goal of the conference is to attract investors from the Arab countries to develop infrastructure in Palestine and the occupied territories as well. U.S. officials said the conference will not focus on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, the border between territories or the issues surrounding Jerusalem and the Palestinian refugees. They said they will, however, address what they call the deal of the century, which aims to designate Jerusalem as the capital of Israel and annex the West Bank to the country and to deny Palestinians their right to return to their lands. Palestinian officials also denounced the U.S. attempt to give Palestine big sums of money and investments so they will stop asking for a Palestinian state. They say that is one of the main objectives of this coming conference. Meanwhile, the demolition of Palestinian homes continues, which are then replaced with Israeli settlements. Thank you, Nayara. 47 migrants who have been stranded on the Mediterranean Sea for days have disembarked on the Italian island of Lampedusa despite threats from Interior Minister Matteo Salvini. In a televised speech, Salvini vowed to make sure that the ship operated by German charity organization Sea-Watch does not dock in any other of their ports. However, a magistrate gave an order to the port and immigration authorities to allow the migrants to disembark. And the U.S. Embassy in Uganda has announced it is aware of reports of 
U.S. pastor who is distributing an extremely dangerous substance said to be a miracle cure to people. The substance is said to actually be a solution made up from industrial bleach, which the pastor is reportedly claiming that the toxic fluid eradicates cancer, HIV, malaria, and most other diseases. The solution was being given to infants as young as 14 months old. In Algeria, armed forces chief have called for a speedy formation of committee to su supervise long sought presidential elections without mentioning a date for the vote. Lieutenant General Ahmed Gaed Salah said elections are the best way to overcome the country's ongoing political crisis and to avoid a constitutional vacuum. A presidential election had previously been scheduled for July 4th. Like this, we've come to the end of this news brief, but you can find this and much more other stories on our website, telestoryenglish.net, where, of course, you can read opinion article or watch our special interviews. Continue with Telestory, connecting the global thousands. Until next time, thank you for watching.